So, yeah, last week was Kotlin Conf, and there's all these really cool, exciting things happening in Kotlin. Uh, but this talk is going to just kind of be the opposite of that. So sorry if you were ex expecting something really, really cutting edge. I'm just going to talk about some of the changes that have happened over the past year in Kotlin, um, because a lot of them are easy to miss in the day-to-day. -day, you don't check the release notes every time there's a release. Um, but uh, sometimes there's some really cool stuff that you... Uh, miss, and you don't even know it exists because it got added in in some patch version that you weren't paying attention to. So I'm going to go through most of these really quickly because there's a lot of really small things. Feel free to raise your hand if you want me, if you have a question about any of them and you want me to spend a little bit more time on it, I'll be more willing to do that. Um, but my default is going to be to just kind of go through most of these pretty quickly. So we kicked off the year with the multi-platform overhaul. Um, and so most people doing Kotlin are doing Android, right, or JVM and maybe haven't paid much attention to multi-platform in the past. The tooling for it was pretty immature coming into 2019, but right at the beginning of 2019, Kotlin 1.3.20 came out, and with that came a whole new suite of Gradle plugins um, and a whole new like structure of how multi-platform works on Kotlin. So one of the, some of the big changes are instead of doing a separate module for every language, you can now put them all into one module um, with just different source sets for each language. Um, and the new pl plugin is a lot easier to use. At first, it was kind of tough because all the examples online were still using the old, for the old formatting, the old Gradle plugin. Um, and so it was kind of hard to use this stuff out of the box, but they've beefed up the documentation since. Um, and so now it's a much better experience. So right here, um, and if, if you're far away from this screen, there's a screen on that wall there you can see. And well, no one's really back there. But um, this is just an example of what a build script looks like um, now using the new plugin. Um, it's very minimal. This script right here sets up a multi-platform project uh, with common code and JVM code. Um, compiling to other targets such as native is as simple as that JVM line that you see there, but just saying like the native platform that you're targeting. It's very, very simple in the Gradle DSL, or rather, uh, yeah, this is the Kotlin Gradle DSL specifically, but it's very similar if you're doing Groovy still. Um, okay, so then the next, uh, or I think it was the same update, uh, 1.3.20, improved inline classes a bit. That was a newer feature that was added towards the end of last year, um, but it had some interesting restrictions on it at first, and they heard the feedback from the community and cleared up some of those restrictions. So you can now uh, define uh, an inner class inside of an inline class, use inline functions instead of inside of inline classes, uh, and pass references to inline classes as arguments to inline functions. That if you haven't used inline classes or functions before, that last one specifically probably sounds like nonsense to you. That's okay. These are very corner case things, but it's a little bit nicer to use inline classes. If you haven't used inline classes before, you should check them out. They're a useful tool. All right, next. Um, you can now have um, some more operations on unsigned number arrays. Um, so unsigned ints and such were something that were added to Kotlin uh, at the end of last year. Um, they made that a little bit better. So you might have seen in Kotlin like int array, and that's like different than an array of ints, right? Um, and that's because it is an array of, um, uh, 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 sorry, I'm blanking on the word, um, non-boxed. <laughs> What's the word for non-boxed? Pop, pop quiz. Primitive, there it is. <laughs> okay, so primitive ints, right? So you can't have those as a generic type on an array or a collection, so there's special ones just for that, like int array. Um, now there's unsigned int array, and now you can get filter map, all, max, min, et cetera, all those collection operations you can have on your unsigned number arrays. Um, and there's no longer, when you're, when you're chaining these operations together, there's no longer the overhead of like boxing and unboxing that was actually happening under the hood. So they removed that. Um, so there's a new uh, extension function, uh, or maybe not extension, just a new function uh, called type of in Kotlin 1.3.40. Um, that allows you to access the reified type using reflection. Uh, this is only when you're on the JVM, but um, this lets you, like, for example, leverage reified types in the Kotlin code if you're interoperating to Java. So now you can actually return back the actual class type just from having a reified type in your function. Um, so that's mostly just for glue between Java and Kotlin code. Um, okay, so. Um, on that multi-platform uh, theme, 
they beefed up some of the support for uh, Kotlin JS. Um, in the Gradle DSL, you can now, it has native support for NPM dependencies. So if you are targeting JS as one of your targets in a Kotlin multi-platform project, adding an NPM registry is as simple as this, um, pr pretty straightforward. Um, that's very easy now. Um, more standard library stuff, bit manipulation operators. Um, so you can like actually operate on the number, on the actual raw bits behind um, like an integer or a string data type. Um, there's a bunch of them. That's just some examples right there. Okay, so this is a little bit beefier. Um, there's a new duration and time measurement API. Now, if you're, if you're coding on the JVM, you're probably just using the java.time API. Um, it's quite good at this point, um, post Java 8. But um, if you're doing multi-platform, you don't have access to that. So there was a demand for adding in an actual native Kotlin time API. Um, so they did do that. Um, and one of the nice things about it is it comes with a function that lets you measure the time a code, a block of code executes. So it's a higher order function here, measure time to value. You can return whatever you want from that. And what you can get back is both the value that you return and how long it took for that code to run. So that's really nice for um, benchmarking code uh, and things like that. Um, so new null checks. Um, <laughs> this with the Java interop stuff is actually going to be huge. This is a preview feature. So it's in 1.3.60, which was just released um, a couple weeks ago or last week. Um, but it's really just an experimental feature that is going to fully launch in 1.4, which is coming next year. Um, but there's no such thing anymore as Kotlin null pointer exception or any of those um, weird exceptions you would get with nulls in Kotlin. Um, this happens a lot, especially when you're interacting with platform types um, that are like Java types that you're, you're receiving in. So now um, you will get a regular Java Lang null pointer exception, which is nice. It's a lot easier to like understand what that is. <laughs> but here's the kicker. It's going to tell you what was null. It will actually tell you the, the symbol of the thing that is null. Um, so that's huge. I mean, anyone who writes Java for a living, I, I would assume would recognize that this is a big deal, especially when you're interopping with uh, Java, which has a lot of nulls and, and things like that. Java 13, I think, is getting the same feature, um, but we're getting it now. <laughs> so uh, we're ahead of the curve on that one. Um, another preview for 1.4 is being able to use break and continue inside of a win expression. So previously they had banned that because they thought they might want to use continue and break inside of whens to mean things that like old switch expressions in Java used to have, but they decided, nah, we don't need it. Even Java is like trying to move away from that. Um, so if you have a when expression inside of a for loop, um, which, okay, fine, like maybe you'll do this, I don't know. Um, but if you do, you can use continue and break to break out of that outer for loop now. That used to be a legal sy syntax before. Um, so yeah, this line of, this block of code, if you actually execute it, will only output one, two, three, four. Okay, here's the big one. So I'll spend a little bit more time on this one. Flows. So flows are a high-level API on top of coroutines and another low-level uh, library called channels. And so if I could explain this like in one sentence, I would say it is the fulfillment that of the promise of coroutines. Um, coroutines are this low-level API. Probably very few people really understand how they work under the hood, right? But they're this way to do asynchronous things, right? Some people do. Some people understand it, <laughs> but um, it's a low-level API. It's always meant to be a low-level API. What most developers are really looking for is like, hey, where's my reactive streams, right? Like that's what, are you doing Rx Java right now or something like that, uh, or Webflux in Spring? That's what you want, right, with your asynchronous code. This is what flows give you. So it's built on top of coroutines. It's coroutines native, but allows you to quickly build asynchronous um, sequences, basically, um, with a flow builder, which you see on top there. And then you can use that sequence, which is called a flow. So you can use the flow in a way like you can any other collection, which you see on bottom here. And it will lazily evaluate it, um, running the tasks asynchronously to generate the values, um, basically do the Rx stream kind of stuff for you. Um, so this is, this is huge. Um, Spring Boot 
Webflux already has native support for flows. Um, so you can switch over to it today, thanks to Sebastian Dell, who's doing great work at Pivotal for this stuff. Um, so I have written a service, actually, that uses these flows with Spring Web Flux, and it is great. It is fantastic, performs very well, um, and is super easy to use. So it removes a lot of the headaches of trying to use coroutines, um, just like raw as they are. Yes, question? Well, coroutines as they are, yes, they may be but in the more simple cases, um, they allow you to customize, for example, which dispatcher you want to use. How, do you, how does replacing the word launch with flow or the word async with flow, for example, change anything if you still want to customize it? Sure. So the question was about, like, coroutines give you a lot of flexibility about, like, how you assign work to dispatchers um, and how those coroutines actually run. And so how do flows interact with that? So. You still have the ability to do that here. The flow builder is like a shortcut, but you can also build a flow like straight as like a coroutine, like context. Um, so it, it can still be done. You can still modify the way it works under the hood um, if you want to. So that's there for you. Um, the API is just a little bit different. It's a little bit more verbose to do that. So. The, so, so in this case, the fu the function. So the question was like, what does that function foo at the top like do, right? Um, so it returns a flow immediately, and it will start executing the code inside of that flow higher order function there, that lambda. Um, so you'll see that first it hits a delay. So it'll return the flow immediately, but as soon as you try to access the first element in this collection, like on that in that main method. As soon as you try to collect it, when it gets that first element, it's going to block until that first element comes back. And then once it does, it emits that element out. You will be able to consume it, and then it will go do whatever work it needs to do until it's trying to consume the next element. And then if the flow has gotten there first, the flow is going to the, the flow basically like keeps running if it can. Like and it, it has like a buffer, like it can collect results. Like so that they can multiple results can be ready. So it's not going to block in, if nothing's listening to it. Um, but your code that consumes it will block until something is available, or you end the flow. Um, now, like I said, flows are built on top of not just coroutines, but also channels. Um, and channels are really interesting, and you can wire them up in a lot of different ways that aren't just like this. This is like one specific, basically implementation, a common use case. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with channels. Um, and uh, Roman Elizarov has some blog posts online about uh, concurrency and channels and like what all this stuff is, cold flows and, and all these. So if you want to learn more about like what's going on under the hood, I recommend reading about it from those articles because I'm not the best person. There's another question? Yeah. Sure. So a channel is is almost kind of like a um, like a message kind of uh, conduit. So like you can publish to it or you can subscribe to it. So it's kind of like a pub sub kind of paradigm. Um, whereas a flow is more like a collection. It's like an asynchronous collection. So it's more abstract. You're you're not like bothered with specifically like who's subscribing to this thing or whatever. Um, but the channels are more, are more like a traditional like like publish subscribe kind of like. Um, socket or um, pipe. pipe, yeah. Thank you. But they're a lot more low level. Like if you want to do stuff with channels directly, it's not this easy. <laughs> so channels are hot. Like, you don't need to start publishing. If you don't subscribe, it's still going to be. Oh yeah, that's a good point. This with flows, it takes care of a lot of stuff. It's a control until you subscribe. It's much safer. Channels are very low level APIs and. Even if you ask, Roman says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that I mean, the, what the paradigm there is uh, just just to repeat uh, real quickly in case everyone didn't hear. Like channels are hot. Like when you publish, it's like it's publishing now. If something's not subscribed, doesn't get it. Flows are cold. Like I said, they can they can kind of cache those values, and when the subscribers are ready to consume them, they'll be there for them. Um, also, don't don't use channels. That was the other part of it. <laughs> But um, anyway, and I think that, that, ooh, yeah, that was the last one. 
Um, so, yeah, um, thanks again. Um, oh, I just wanted to ask one more thing that I forgot to at the beginning. Um, who here is their first time attending a Chicago Kotlin user group event? All right, cool. Well, welcome. <laughs> who here is the first time um, attending a GoTo event? All right, like it's like 50-50, so awesome. And some new faces, talk to your neighbors, meet each other, and uh, hopefully we see each other at each other's uh, events more. Thank you.